hate to have you run competition with yourself, but uh, while you take a breather, I'd like to invite you to the dialogue and feedback after the uh, meeting and the probands. Uh, it's a learning experience for me as well, and I uh, appreciate that opportunity. So if you have any comments, questions, answers, feedback, uh, feel free to stay with us tonight for a little while after this topic. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. Shall we try it once more? We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. you feel if the first thing you got to heaven, you discovered that HMS Richards was missing, and then you discovered that uh, Adolf Hitler lived next door. <laughs> I tried this question recently, and uh, someone said I would decide that I'd gotten to the wrong place. But suppose that you actually did come up with some terrible experience in which your immediate response was a big question. So you go out to the streets of gold and you pass the first angelic messenger. You stop him and you say, pardon me, is it all right to ask questions here? And he says, what do you want to ask? And you tell him about your problem. You don't understand. And he says, no, don't ask that question. The Lord knows those who are his. And you say, well, okay. And you try not to ask anything more about that forever, but you have a big question mark in the back of your mind. Well, let's thicken the plot just a little. Suppose the first thing you get to heaven is you discover that one of your closest relatives, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, is missing. And uh, you were worried about that. He uh, actually or she went down the tube on drugs. And uh, so they're missing. Then you discover that living next door to you is the one that got them on the drugs. Now you go out to the street and you say, pardon me, is it all right to ask some questions here? And they say, what do you want to ask? He said, I have a real problem. I don't understand. And they say, no, don't ask that. The Lord knows those who are his. And you say, uh, would you mind showing me to the gate? Am I going too far? Now I realize that I'm trying to stir up your pure minds and perhaps this is too melodramatic a beginning but we know that there are going to be some big surprises in heaven isn't that true? and um, the big surprises are going to be based upon the premise that um, People that we were certain were going to be there might be missing, and others we thought sure would not be there will be present. Someone handed me a little poem that's on target. I dreamed death came the other night, and heaven's gate swung wide, 
With kindly grace, an angel ushered me inside. And there, to my astonishment, stood folk I'd known on earth, some I'd judged and labeled unfit of little worth. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free, for many faces showed surprise they weren't expecting me. <laughs> and of course, the reason that this sort of thing happens is because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks where? On the heart. Now, there's another question that sometimes uh, we should stop short on. And that is, uh, when you get to heaven, are you going to be happy there? And most people's immediate response is, oh, yes, if, if I'm the last one in the gates, I'll be happy there. Not so fast. Because there are going to be loved ones missing. We know that. We know that the Bible says clearly, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Not because it's hard, but because few want it. So, um, are you sure you're going to be happy there? with someone close to you missing. And has God made provision for certainty, not only of getting to heaven, but for certainty that we'll be happy there forever? It seems to me that these are heavy-duty questions that all revolve around something that is known as the pre-advent judgment. Now, there was a famous meeting called the Glacier View Meeting. You may have heard about it. And after that meeting, we were anxious at Pacific Union College for people to hear firsthand what had gone on there. We arranged for some of the VIPs to be present on Sabbath afternoon, right after the Glacier View meeting, and give a report. So the vice president of our general conference and others were present, and they told us what went on there concerning the dialogue relative to the sanctuary and judgment, etc. And then we had questions and answers after that symposium, and I can still hear the question of someone from the back of the room who stood up and said, with gravel in his voice, Who needs the pre-advent judgment anyway? And I said to myself, that question demands an answer. That is a fair question. Isn't it? And when many people today are considering the pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment, bad news? I think we need to take a second look. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, have an interesting phrase describing it. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What is that? The everlasting what does the gospel mean? The everlasting good news. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Some of us felt some time back that uh, the everlasting part of this message was fear God, give glory to him, and worship him. But that the hour of his judgment is come will not be everlasting because, according to our understanding and prophetic interpretation, that has only been current since 1844. But we've changed our minds. It has always been 
It is everlasting good news that the hour of God's judgment comes, or is coming, and is come. And I'd like to demonstrate to you tonight why. Oh, someone says, we're not going to be there, so what importance is it to us? Yes, we're going to be there. And God has made provision for people who stand on a sea that looks like glass, shot through with fire, to say the words that our scripture reading presented a moment ago. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who will not serve thee and praise thee, and these will be people for whom some of their loved ones are missing. Isn't this possible? Are they going to say it because they are forced into it, or are they going to say it from the heart? Who needs the judgment? Well, who needs any judgment? Who needs the court scene? Who needs the trial? Why do they exist in the first place? I was um, meeting with a group of attorneys from the Lake Union not too long ago, and it was very interesting to talk about some of the things that uh, pertain to the judgment with these attorneys. In fact, some of them got to reminiscing about the old days of the circuit riders, you know, the circuit judge and the circuit lawyers who used to ride into town in the early days of our country and take care of the cases that had accumulated. And out of that meeting, a uh, little parable was born. Maybe I can uh, try it out on you. It sort of smacks of the Old West when the Old West was Illinois. And it's in two parts, the way it was and the way it wasn't. Please notice the contrast between the two parts. It is very significant. There was great excitement in the little town of Mill Creek, Illinois, that afternoon in 1845. Eighth Illinois Circuit Judge David Davis of Bloomingdale had just arrived. As usual, he was accompanied by several circuit lawyers, including one named Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's presence added to the stir of excitement, for Mill Creek citizens had not forgotten the other times when he had come to town with Judge Davis. And in addition to being an excellent lawyer, Abe Lincoln told the funniest stories anyone had ever heard. It had been almost six months since the last court session in Mill Creek, and there was quite an accumulation of cases to be tried. Old Thomas Jacobs was suspected of setting fire to the blacksmith shop. He and the blacksmith had had words. Old Thomas had made some pretty dark threats, and that very night the blacksmith shop had burned to the ground. There were witnesses who said they had seen Old Thomas there at the fire, laughing like anything and slapping his knees. Then there was the fight at the tavern between Henry Whitney and Ebenezer Bates. Whitney had finally pulled out his pistol and shot Ebenezer in cold blood. Some said that Ebenezer had asked for it and that Whitney was only defending himself, but others sided with Ebenezer and said it was murder, plain and simple. Perhaps the most outstanding case was that of Jesse Adams. He had ridden into town one day, gone straight up to the Mill Creek Bank, shoved his gun under the teller's nose, and demanded all the bank's cash. He'd managed to get about 15 miles out of town before the sheriff and his deputy caught up with him, and he had been in the town jail ever since. In addition to these more spectacular cases, there were the usual disputes over property lines, debts and foreclosures, slander suits, and a man named Silas Foster had been accused of stealing pigs. Well, that's about as good as anything you can see on TV today. The announcement was made that the court would convene the following week, and people began bringing in their legal business. The lawyers went to work immediately on the cases assigned to them, and when the time that had been announced arrived, the circuit court convened. The whole town crowded into the courthouse, and during each recess could be heard hotly discussing the pros and cons of each case. 
The lawyers examined and cross-examined and called out objections at every opportunity. Abe Lincoln had a knack for bringing the truth to light, and in the cases that he defended, even the prosecution ended up admitting that he was right. As the people listened to each case and heard the evidence for themselves, they were convinced that justice was being dealt. One by one, the cases were brought before the court, the juries withdrew to deliberate, and a verdict was reached, guilty or not guilty. As Judge Davis sentenced those who had been found guilty, and as those found innocent were acquitted, the town was satisfied. The last morning that the judge and his lawyers were in town, there was a hanging. Henry Whitney had been found guilty of murder, and the circuit judge and his company moved on to the next town. That's the way it was. Now we back up and start over. This time, the way it wasn't. There was great excitement in the little town of Mill Creek, Illinois, that afternoon in 1845. 8th Illinois Circuit Judge David Davis of Bloomingdale had just arrived, accompanied by Abe Lincoln and several other circuit lawyers. It had been almost six months since the last court session in Mill Creek, and there was quite an accumulation of cases to be tried. Old Thomas Jacobs was suspected of setting fire to the blacksmith shop. There had been a fight at the tavern between Henry Whitney and Ebenezer Bates, and Bates was dead. Jesse Adams was in jail awaiting trial for bank robbery, and there was the usual assortment of lesser disputes. It was announced that the court would convene immediately. The whole town crowded into the courthouse. Judge Davis banged his gavel on the desk and said, Thomas Jacobs, not guilty. Silas Foster, not guilty. Henry Whitney, guilty as charged to be hanged at sunrise. Jesse Adams, not guilty. Court is closed. The prosecuting attorney jumped to his feet. You can't do that, he cried. Who do you think you are anyway? You can't acquit these people without a fair trial or sentence them before they're proven guilty. The townspeople sided with the prosecuting attorney. He's right, they said. How does the judge know who is guilty and who isn't? Abe Lincoln raised his voice to be heard above the tumult. Don't you people trust the judge? The judge knows those who are his. He's been keeping tabs on things while he's been back at Bloomingdale. He has kept careful records. He has evidence. And he doesn't make mistakes. But the people became even more upset. The judge may have evidence, and he may not, they said. But we don't have evidence. It's not enough just to claim to have evidence. It must be examined openly before the sentence is given. The whole court needs to see the evidence, not just the judge. The circuit lawyers kept trying desperately to convince the people of Mill Creek that the judge could be trusted. But the people insisted that trust had to be based on an intelligent understanding of the reasons for the judge's decisions. The last morning that the judge and his lawyers were in town, there was a hanging. It was the judge who was hung. <laughs> Does this parable speak for itself? Who needs the judgment? And why does a court trial take place in the first place? Because there's been a charge made. And who makes the charge? There's a prosecution. And who all needs the judgment? The prosecution needs it. All of the court needs it. All of the townspeople need it. The judge needs it. Have you ever noticed in Revelation 14, 6, and 7 that it's the hour of God's judgment that comes? That takes it away from us in a sense. God is up for judgment. And if we were to confine the pre-advent judgment down to simply your name or my name, and come up with this mistaken idea that it is the investigative judgment that decides our cases, we may have missed the whole point. Now, biblically, I'd like to give you about four facts. Number one, there is a pre-advent judgment. 
We read about it in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Check the context. There is a pre-advent judgment. Number two, God does nothing of that kind of importance unless he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. Isn't this so? And so you find, for instance, in Daniel 7, 8, and 9, the prophecy of the pre-advent judgment. And please, notice, you take Daniel 7, 8, and 9 together, you don't study Daniel 8 all by itself. These are parallel prophecies. Daniel 7, 8, and 9 go together. Don't miss that point. It is an extremely important point. And you can't miss the fact that there is a pre-advent judgment in Daniel 7, 8, and 9. Number three. Jesus preached the pre-advent judgment. Jesus taught it. In fact, Jesus taught the investigative judgment. That's our topic tomorrow morning, going to the wedding naked. And some of us have been surprised to find out how clearly, in just a few verses, Jesus taught it. Number four, as you study the possible purpose of the pre-advent judgment, these facts emerge. Number one, a point that we've already noticed. God is interested not only in justifying sinners, but in being just at the same time. Romans 3, verse 26. The cross and the complete atonement justifies God for forgiving anyone. Ever since the friendly arms of the cross pointed the way to the heavenly country, it's been good news. God is able to forgive anyone. Number two, the pre-advent judgment justifies God for forgiving the ones who are forgiven. As you know, everyone doesn't get forgiven, only those who have accepted his forgiveness. There is no such thing as salvation by grace alone. It is always salvation by grace through faith. And that demands that God's salvation be accepted by the sinner. The pre-advent judgment reveals those who have accepted and continued to accept of his justifying grace. Number three, the post-advent judgment, or perhaps we should call it the post-advent review, justifies God for not forgiving the ones who are not forgiven. Let's go over those three points quickly again. Number one, the cross justifies God for forgiving anyone. Number two, the pre-advent judgment justifies God for forgiving the ones who are forgiven. Number three, the post-advent judgment, the thousand years, justifies God for not forgiving the ones who are not forgiven. Well, there are some people who say this pre-advent judgment can be nothing but uh, bad news. Because how can you have a God taking all of these years since 1844 pouring through the books up there to see who's going to make it? And this brings us aware of some big misunderstandings. You think God is pouring through the books trying to get down to the last letter in the alphabet in time? Or do you agree with those who are saying today that God, as far as God is concerned, he could accomplish the whole pre-advent judgment in a microsecond? Hasn't God heard of microfilm? Do you suppose he's heard of computers? 
And what about the books? You know, we get bogged down in the books. And we uh, try to figure out if they're big books or little books. Are they in paperback or deluxe binding? And when the Bible talks about books, it's simply talking about records. And why does God keep records? Well, one reason, because the devil keeps records. The devil keeps records of everything he's caused you to do wrong. And I can see God looking down at the devil's records and saying, you want to keep records? All right, we'll keep records. And God keeps meticulous records. Not for the sake of seeing how many people he can keep out of heaven. He's trying to see how many he can get in. To see how many he can get in over and above the charges of the prosecution. James White opposed the idea of the pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment when it first came along on the horizon among our pioneers. James White opposed it because he said almost the same thing that some are saying today. Because, he said, the righteous have their names already written in heaven. So who needs the judgment? Then, as he compared notes with others of the pioneers, he began to see a bigger reason, a bigger purpose. And those of us who have had the idea that the only reason for the pre-advent judgment is to go through our names and decide who's going to make it have a very narrow view. There are more chapters on this, by the way, than two or three in the middle of Great Controversy. including one in the book called Desire of Ages, the title, It is Finished. It is Finished. Read it if you want to look at big issues. Big issues. Now, it is uh, claimed that the reason we have to get rid of the pre-advent judgment is so we can have assurance. Wait a minute. If I have to get rid of the pre-advent judgment in order to have assurance of salvation, that is saying something about me. You know what it says about me? It says that I am a legalist. Because if I really believe the gospel, that what Jesus did at the cross was complete, and that he, on the basis of the cross, can forgive me, and give me justification, and cause me to stand before God and man as though I had never even sinned, then the pre-advent judgment has nothing to do with my assurance, even if my name does come up. There was a meeting at PUC, a forum meeting, in which a man by the name of Jeffrey Paxton was present from Australia. He was talking about the shaking of Adventism. Perhaps you heard about this. And at the close of his talk, he said that he had been going around the United States giving talks to Adventists, and an Adventist preacher had come up to him and had said, after his talk, Oh, what a relief! What a relief! You got rid of my perfection ideas, and now I can have assurance. You got rid of my perfection ideas, and now I can have assurance. Now, I don't think fast, but I think long. And I laid awake at night about that one. And gradually it began to come clear. If this man did not have assurance before because of his perfection ideas, then he was a legalist, wasn't he, before? He thought that his perfection had something to do with his being saved in heaven. And Paul was vehement against this point. By the deeds of the law there shall no man be justified, right? We are justified by faith. Without the deeds of the law. Our good deeds have nothing whatever to do with causing us to be saved. And anyone who had lack of assurance because of his perfection ideas demonstrated thereby that he was a legalist. But wait a minute, take the next step. If I have to keep rid 
of perfection ideas, in order to continue to have assurance, I'm still a legalist. You follow me? Come on. If the only way I can have assurance is to keep any perfection ideas out of the way, I'm still a legalist. If I have to get rid of the judgment in order to have assurance, I'm a legalist because I'm advertising the fact that I believed that my deeds had something to do with causing my salvation. And the very fact that I have to get rid of the judgment and keep the judgment out on the horizon proves that I'm still a legalist in order to have assurance. If I really believe the gospel, I can keep the judgment. I can keep whatever the Bible says about perfection because my eternal destiny is based upon what Jesus already did at the cross. And so anyone who has to get rid of the judgment and perfection and an Ellen White, if you please, in order to have assurance is advertising that he's still a legalist. Think it through carefully. In fact, I would like to go so far as to hazard this statement. That some of the present trends under the title of the gospel are some of the most subtle forms of legalism that have ever hit. Now, um, If I am interested more in God than I am in getting myself to heaven, then I am very much interested in the pre-advent judgment for the sake of God. It's the hour of God's judgment. And have you ever read it in the book Steps to Christ? We should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. What is it that's the center when we are indulging anxiety about whether we're going to be saved? Self is the center. All this, it says, turns the mind away from God to self. It says, commit the keeping of your souls to God. He's already taken care of the issue of our salvation. We can trust him. Do you believe that? Now, oh, God is interested in the pre-advent judgment in setting up the stakes so that we not only have the certainty of being in heaven, but the certainty and the assurance of being happy there forever. And here's the way it works. During the thousand years, you and I will show up at the pre-advent judgment. How? We, after we discover who's missing and who's living next door, we go out into the street and we say, pardon me, is it all right to ask questions? And they say, yes, it is. What would you like to know? And we present our problem and they say, yes, we had a pre-advent review and we'd like you to know what went on so you can understand. And we do understand. And God in his wisdom presents evidence so that our hearts will beat on his side in rhythm with him forever. We will attend the pre-advent judgment during the post-advent. That's when we're there. And the reason that God has made this provision is because God has always treated his creatures as intelligent beings. Now, just for the sake of illustration, let's go back. Let's go back, way back when Lucifer first sinned. And the day after, God calls him in before his throne and kills him on the spot. And the next day, the angels come around and they say, uh, where's Lucifer? And God says, uh, he's gone. And they say, what's gone? And God says, I uh, killed him. What's killed? And why 
why did you do that? He says, I killed him because he sinned. And they say, what sin? Right? And they say, we'd like to know where Lucifer is. And God says, don't you trust me? And they say, well, we did up until now. <laughs> and then God says, don't ask any more questions. The Lord knows those who are his. But God didn't operate that way, did he? Instead, he had given intelligent creatures the power of choice with the possibility that something could go wrong. And he made provision for it in his love and wisdom. And he continued to treat them as intelligent creatures. And he set himself to this course, that if sin came, he would let it work itself out to its ultimate destiny and ruin, so that it would never happen again. And he would make provision for the people where sin came to more than make up to them for the inconvenience of having been born here. And he would let them take the place of the angels who fell. And that's exciting too, isn't it? If God had ever wanted to use the phrase, the Lord knows those who are his, and I can't tell you how often we've heard that the last two years. If God had ever wanted to make use of that phrase, he should have used it way back there. Before sin and sickness and pain and sorrow and death and tears and heartache. But he didn't. And the reason people will trust him now and the reason they will trust him forever is because he lets them understand. Trust is based on understanding. The good news of the judgment is that God is still treating his creatures as intelligent beings. Secondly, the good news of the judgment is that Jesus is my judge as well as my attorney, i.e. this morning's presentation. And number three, another reason why it's good news is because our custody is about over. We've noticed that at the end of the Day of Atonement there came the taking of the scapegoat away into the wilderness. We've noticed at the end of the thousand years there comes a time when a great city comes down from heaven and everyone who's ever lived or died meets for the first and last time. Those on the inside looking out and those on the outside looking in. And then there's a 360 degree universal television that takes place high above the throne of God and everyone sees the great controversy and panorama from God's audiovisual department. And we see the scenes of Gethsemane and the cross and the thorns and the blood and the broken heart. Everyone sees it, including the enemy himself. And then, according to the picture, the enemy himself is forced out of the dimension in which he operates. And everyone looks at him, apparently, perhaps high up on a ledge somewhere. God makes it possible for all to see him. And according to Isaiah, the 14th chapter, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. I don't know what that means, but I can see them squinting through their eyes and looking. And they will say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? And all the prisoners are now going to be free forever. The scapegoat, Azazel. Why are the sins confessed on him and the iniquities on him? Because Jesus paid the penalty for sin. Jesus took the curse of sin. Jesus took the price of sin. Jesus took the wages of sin. Jesus took the guilt of sin. But Jesus never took the responsibility for sin. And God has never been responsible for sin. That's why the responsibility goes back on the scapegoat at the end. 
And then fire comes down from heaven, and fire comes up from the earth, and fire comes from the middle of him himself. And Lucifer is gone. And I used to think that at that point, we'd all be throwing our hats in the air and blowing the bugles and beating the drums and shouting for joy. And then it dawned. Wait a minute. In the early days of the Old West, when the desperados were hung, and all the town and all the countryside came out with their lunches and their Kool-Aid to watch the hanging, like a picnic, there was often a mother back in the crowd somewhere who still loved to the end, and whose heart was broken, and whose tears flowed freely. Isn't that so? And where did mothers get that kind of love from the God who makes mothers? And if Lucifer was one of God's crowning creations way back, one of his own, don't tell me that God is going to be shouting for joy. I can see God convulsed in anguish when Lucifer and the angels are destroyed. And I can see Jesus sobbing out his heart. And all the angels don't touch their harps. And all the righteous begin to weep with them. Because God hates sin, but he still loves his creatures. Isn't that true? And then I can see the Holy Spirit coming along. He's the comforter, and he brings the handkerchief. And he wipes God's eyes. And he helps the rest of them. And then we go and we sit down at a long table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus is waiting table as usual. And he says, here, have you tried this yet? What about another helping of this? And how about that? And God has the hanky now and he's wiping away all tears from their eyes. And there should be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, because God has arranged things in such a way that we will not only be happy to get there, we will be happy there forever. I'm excited about the pre-Advent judgment. And I invite you to do some serious thinking about it in the days to come. Shall we pray? Your Father in heaven, we're thankful that you still treat us as intelligent creatures. We're thankful that you have a sacred regard for our power of choice. We're often disappointed at our performance, but we're not discouraged with the... We pray tonight that you'll help us to see the bigger picture in all of these things. Keep us from impulsive action. And help us to know for ourselves, you as our friend, Jesus as our lawyer, and our judge, we pray in his name. Amen.